Live from the News Hub at Adesawa in Kandakra, this is Midday Live on TV3, also live on DSTV Channel 279. My name is Grace Hamwa Asari, top of the bulletin this afternoon. Academic group in Nigeria hits back at Ghana, warning removal of Nigerian professor Kodma Ghana Nigeria relations. Also, electricity tariffs up by 11.17%. And on the international front, it is emerging that President Donald Trump has approved retaliatory military strikes against Iran on Thursday before changing his mind. Details of these stories and more in the next 60 minutes. Let's go to our first story now. The Save Atiwa Coalition, made of environmental NGOs, have presented a petition to Parliament in a bid to put pressure on government to rescind its decision to mine bauxite in the Atiwa Forest. Convener of the group, Daryl Bosu, maintained government does not need to mine the bauxite in the Atiwa Forest Reserve to be able to carry out its responsibilities. Let's now cross over to Salam Amena who has been monitoring the event in the House of Parliament. So while we're crossing over to Salom, the Save to our coalition made of environmental NGOs have presented a petition to Parliament in a bid to put pressure on government to rescind its decision to mine bauxite in the Etiwa forest. Convener of the group, Daryl Bosu, maintained government does not need to mine the bauxite in the Etiwa forest reserve to be able to carry out its responsibilities. Salom is ready now to join us from Parliament. You heard the majority leader. Were you convinced? Clearly, he, he had the same posture that we should not forget that government needs uh, the money to do all this. Yes, I know government has been given that particular narrative that we need the money. But we all know Ghana should learn from our history. 100 years of mining in this country, where has it gotten us to? Of course, people will say we get a lot of money, we get a lot of revenue and all of that from these places, but where does it get us to? So we are saying that there are better uses for the forest. The forest is not just a source of bauxite, it's also a source of water for 5 million people. We want government to sit down critically, do the math, put it together, what does it take to actually provide water for 5 million people? One of the critical components of providing water services is watershed. Atua Forest is providing that particular service. There is no forest in Ghana as unique as that forest. And we are saying that you need to all bear in mind that, all of us need to bear in mind that we are not against bauxite mining in this country. What we are saying is that the right things must be done. First of all, we need to identify which areas in this country we can mine, which areas we cannot mine. And when we even determine that, let's do a due diligence analysis. What will it take to ensure that we do not destroy? Let us bear also in mind that bauxite mining is one of the most destructive industries. Once you touch an area, that's it. They have been talking about sustainable mining and all of that. We know that is just a farce. And even the issue of jobs is also a mirage. It's not possible. There is no evidence to wait. So we are saying, let's look at the options which will bring more benefits, well-being to the, the masses. Instead of bauxite mining and all the mineral associated industry, which is associated with a few people benefiting, let's look at options that will secure our resilience to climate change, provide us with water, and also secure our forest, which is also we owe the future generation an opportunity to hand over to. Right, finally, be, be beyond this petition, what else are you going to do? It looks like the deal is done and they really started assessment and all of that. There is no deal that is ever done. And that is why we are still here. We are still trying to get our voices heard. We are employing all Ghanaians to add their voices to it. We are saying that government can satisfy its obligation under the Sano Hydro deal without touching Atiwa. They are just not being transparent with the process, not being open. If they were, they realize that the, the evidence and a trade off analysis that has been done shows that Atiwa need not be touched. So we are going to continue. We have several other options, and the law allows us to do that appeal to the courts, appeal to parliament as you have done. We are also going to maybe get our, our case heard in the courts eventually. 
All right, thank you very much. So that was uh, Daryl Boso. He is the convener for the Save Atiwa Forest Coalition. So from the Parliament House here in Accra, I am Selom Amenya, TV3 News. And in the studio, my name is Grace Hamwa Asari. Let's move away from that and do something else because a group in Nigeria, the Academic Staff Union of Universities, has jammed to the defense of Nigerian Professor Augustine Wagbara. This follows his dismissal by the University of Education, Winneba, on Thursday. There's more in the following news desk reports. The statement signed by the group's branch chairman at the University of Lagos, Dele Ashiru, expresses reservations about how Professor Magbara's issue has been handled. It says the views expressed by the Nigerian professor should have been viewed purely within the context of academic freedom. The group quotes Articles 3 and 4 of the Kampala Declaration on Intellectual Freedom and Social Responsibility to back its argument. Those provisions, according to the statement, protect African intellectuals from harassment, persecution and intimidation on the basis of opinion or nationality. The Academic Staff Union of Universities in Nigeria further calls on authorities of the UEW and relevant government agencies to ensure the safety of Professor Magbara's life and property. It cautions strongly that, should anything happen to him, both the UEW and the government of Ghana would be held responsible. The group is also quick to add that Ghana and Nigeria's relations hangs in the balance as a result of this development. Let's stay a while longer on this story and speak with Peter Anti, who is Executive Director for the Institute of Education Studies, joining us on the phone lines. Hello, sir. Thank you. You're live on Media Live on TV3. Thank you. Good yeah, so we've had a retaliation from the Nigerian group. Would you describe it um, as something that is necessary looking at the time? Uh, well, uh, what I would what to say is that it's, it's rather unfortunate that things are turning out this way. This is because we know in the academic community there's this sort of exchange between universities uh, where lecturers and senior members go to other universities, either in the country or outside the country, especially for the arts sabbaticals, and sometimes even for PhD programs, let's say programs, conferences, and all those things. What we have to understand is that each of these individual universities that uh, these senior members and lecturers and other people visit have their own standards, they have their own rules, and they have their own ways of doing things. So if someone falls short of the standards and the rules and regulations of that university, the university has the power to deal with the person as they seem fit, irrespective of whether the person is a national, I mean, it's from the country or coming from the outside country. There, there shouldn't be any uh, discrimination in terms of how uh, punishment is meted out to that particular person. So if, according to EUW, they think that the comments and the actions of the professor is not in line with their standards and their rules and regulations, they have the right to deal with the, the professor the best, the, 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 in the way that they deem fit. It therefore becomes very unfortunate when another group from the academic community think that the person is being victimized because of where he or where he is coming from. So that is where our 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 our, our program is coming from. Because if the Ghanaian is in Nigeria, in the Nigerian university, University of Lagos, Eurolin or whatever university, and the person does something that is contrary to the rules and regulations of that particular university, we will expect that the person is dealt according to the rules and regulations of that university and not because he's a Ghanaian he should be let go. Mm. So, Ghana and Nigeria share a lot of exchanges ac and academic credentials. How do you think the upside of this is going to affect the relationship we have and are trying to establish? Personally, I don't think it should, it should affect this kind of academic relation. I have to say that um, the, the professor who taught me in my, in my health school program was a Nigerian. She came from Nigeria to come and do uh, her sabbatical year. And Professor Odin, she is a very brilliant woman and very accommodating. So this kind of relationship will continue to happen. I don't think this 
experience from UEW should my any relationship that any university have with other foreign universities. We just have to cause members that whatever you do, you should know that you are subjected to the laws and regulations of the institution that you are working with. And therefore, you should make sure you play according to the rules and regulations of the university. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Peter Patianti is Executive Director of the Institute of Education Studies. Now, a medical doctor of the St. Joseph Hospital in Kofredia, David Kupualo, has appealed to government to speed up the process of procuring more ambulances to improve response time to emergencies. He made this known when the Catholic Bishop of Kofredia, Most Reverend Joseph Efifa Ajakum, visited the facility to sympathize and pray for survivors of an accident which occurred at Asitevi Mountains near Manyakobo in the eastern region. 61 parishioners of St. Barbara Catholic Church, Akonsombo, including a six-month-old baby, were on board the VRA Daiwu bus when the accident occurred. The parishioners were returning to Akonsombo from Akimoda where they had attended a funeral. Their vehicle reportedly failed its brakes while descending the Asite Mountains some assaulted and ran into a ditch, killing seven persons in the process. 39 of the victims are receiving care at six health facilities, whilst 15 others had been discharged. A medical doctor of the St. Joseph's Hospital, Dr. David Kupualo, said the victim suffered fractures in the limbs. He expressed concern about the unavailability of ambulances at the health facilities in the country and entreated the public to be cautious in handling victims to avoid them losing nerve functions in the neck and arms. Majority of them are stable. We have two still at the emergency um, units. Um, and then at the female side where we are now, there are four of them here currently. Uh, we've moved one to the ward and currently as we speak, they are all in good condition and they are doing quite well. Uh, some of them are also being scheduled uh, to have surgery done later. Early transport to the referral centers could help with the management of the cases and minimize the damages that uh, could occur. But the whole thing is that we should be able to improve upon the ambulance system so that just at the point of the accident, we could have a number of them being transported early to the right places. The Catholic Bishop of Kofrodia, Most Reverend Joseph Afrifa Ajekum, visited the facilities to sympathize and pray for the victims who are parishioners of the Santa Barbara Catholic Church at Consombo. He requested governments to equip the ambulance service whilst cautioning drivers to be careful on the road. There were only three ambulances and I think uh, we need really to work hard to get this because many more lives maybe could have been uh, saved. Let me use this occasion to advise all drivers in this country to be very, very circumspect and cautious when they drive. So as you may well know, the African Cup of Nations, AFCON, is starting today. And ahead of that, members of parliament have urged players of the senior national team, the Black Stars, to give out their best to win the top, top most laurel of bringing the cup back to Ghana from Egypt. The African Cup of Nations begins in a few hours with Ghana seeking to end the decade of drought of trophies. DMPs are urging the players to exhibit patriotism to fly up high the flag of Ghana. The members are contributing to a statement made by the Goma West MP Kojo Asimenya. July for the 32nd edition of the African Cup of Nations. Being one of the participating nations, Ghana will be making her 22nd appearance in Group F, which comprises of Benin, Cameroon, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau on the 25th, 29th of June and the 2nd of July respectively. I would therefore implore the House to garner all the support that we can give to them so that they will bring the trophy hope. With one accord, we wish them well and our prayers are with them. Mr. Speaker, it is an undeniable fact that the Black Stars is one of the decorated teams in Africa. Since the inception of African Cup of Nations in 1957, Ghana has made 22 appearances, 
and has tasted nine finals with four wins and five as runners-up. In the annals of African football, Ghana was the first nation to win the most converted continental trophy for four times, 1963, 1965, 1978, and 1982. As a result of this, the Blast House of Ghana was adjudged and was adjudged the undisputed champions of African football at the end of the 20th century. However, since the beginning of the 21st century, due to series of disappointment, Ghana has lost this sweet accolade to the pharaohs of Egypt for their dominance between 2006 and 2010. Mr. Speaker, it is worthy to note that after the triumphant victory over Libya in 1982, Ghana is yet to taste another continental glory, although the search for the converted continental trophy continued unabated. For 37 years, Ghana had made a record appearance of eight semifinals and three final appearances, of which all these eluded in all all this ended in disappointment. Mr. Speaker, never in our football history have we experienced series of heartbreaks than the period between 2008 and 2017. Historically, Ghana was the first nation to make four consecutive semifinals appearance in the African Cup of Nations. This feat was recorded between 1963 and 1970. So that is the Euphoria there in the House of Parliament as the MPs are cheering on the Black Stars. Let's come back to the studio and speak with Head of Sports for Media General, Michael Oti, who is joining me in the studio. Michael, thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. So you have been doing a diary of the Black Stars as they prepare for mm -hmm. AFCON. What is new? Are they already in Egypt? Well, they arrived moments ago. The official Ghana FA handle tweeted, photos of the players going down the escalator in Ismailia. Uh, they did fly over by a charter flight okay. uh, from their base in Dubai where they spent three weeks. We were privileged as TV3 and Media General to be there for one week of the period observing training in temperatures mostly of around 40 degrees because it's pretty hot mm. in Egypt. Um, observing the players go through training, getting their moves together, trying to build the right sort of team building. So the team is in Egypt at the moment and they will go through their usual training sessions, the welcome ceremonies, and then play their first game, which you'll see live here on TV3, and, and hear commentary of that on Onyo FM, Connect FM, and Akoma FM um, on Tuesday, kickoff time, 5 p.m. Mm. So, Michael, I'm told the last time you won something at the AFCON was 1982. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been very long. What is our chance this time? You know, my response to this every time has been that a uh, chance this year it's no better than it's always been. It's no better than it was in 92 when we lost the final to Ivory Coast after the longest penalty, one of the longest penalty kicks in the history of international football. It's no better than in 96 when we were beaten in the semifinals or in 2008 when after reaching the second round of the World Cup, having some of our best players playing at home. I remember then the studios of TV3 was always adorned with newscasters wearing the national flag every office and we still couldn't win. Yeah. Uh, it's no better than it was in 2015. In sporting terms, this is not a, a particularly great team, but it is still a team that is very capable of competing, a team with players who have played at multiple Nations Cups, a team with some of the best youngsters in the world. And I, and I think that's what, for many people, gives them a bit of hope. But this by no means is a tournament where Ghana is favorite. Mm. So back home in Ghana, Ghanaians are depending heavily on media general platforms to have a feel of the AFCON. Give, what is the assurance that TV3 and other platforms are going to make sure that Ghanaians don't miss everything when it comes to the AFCON? Who are we looking at interviews and experts and analysts coming inside? Well, I think you can already see from the build-up that we've done that we take this as seriously as possible. 
traditionally some of our best content has come from when the Blasters is playing a qualifier and for us the Nations Cup represents mm. uh, a, a very a very big deal so that's why we were in Abu Dhabi in, in uh, Dubai when they were preparing as we did in uh, two years ago as we did in 2015 um, now that the competition itself is starting today we'll be on yeah. air um, from I think it's the kickoff time is uh, 8 p.m. for the game, so we are on there from about 7 p.m. Building up to the game, running interviews. You will see um, some of the uh, diaries build up running. Our local FM stations, that is Unia FM, connecting Takrade, Akuma, in Kumasi, exactly, will run live commentary. 3 FM will run a special program, 10 a.m. every day. That's building up, that's wrapping up on what's happening at the Nations Cup, building up to it. part of our midday live presentations of our news 360 presentations and when everything is done during the day we have a, a one hour program live on tv between 10 30 to 11 30 mm. p.m reflecting on the day's action building up to the next we have interviews with everybody from experts around also on digital because mm. this would also be a heavily digital nation's cup so uh, we have live updates on our social media feeds. We've already been posting yeah, a lot yeah. of the content that we derive from Dubai and the rest on the platform. So mm -hmm. uh, in many ways, just like our News 360 uh, idea says, we are covering this from every conceivable angle and making sure that people are, are informed as much as they can you be. Don't, you don't miss anything. So Michael, let's look at today. We know the opening ceremony is today. Yeah. How is Media General ensuring that we don't miss out on the opening ceremony and other interviews that will even precede the first match itself? We have. Um, we will be. We'll be in the studio today. We'll be with with experts in the studio, building up to with the likes of Neil Lamptey, ex Ghana International, uh, the likes of John Pencil, who played in about five Nations Cups. Uh, we have expert interviews with people who know and understand what Egypt and Zimbabwe means. Yeah what the World Cup means. So from 6 p.m. when we are in the studio, building up to the first game, we will make sure that the various angles are covered. And this will be something that would go on and grow even better as the days happen. You know, for an opening game, there's a, a lot of anxiety. The yeah. team is not sure. You're not sure what opening ceremony we'll see. But we are de committed and determined to ensure that you never miss the best moments of the tournament on this platform. Mm. So Michael's words are well committed and determined to ensure that you don't miss anything when it comes to Afcon. Thank you very much for joining us. Michael OTAJ is head of sports at Media General. You're still watching Media Live on TV3. So stay with us if you don't want to miss out anything when it comes to the Afcon. Let's do some other stuff from kindergarten to the junior high school to wear nose mask during classes. This is a staff common room of the University Staff Business School at Legon. Almost every student from kindergarten to GHS3 is wearing a nose mask due to the stench emanating from the liquid waste spread on the compound of the school. The situation, according to the school's management, is disrupting academic work. The continuous flow of the sewage through the entrance is gradually spreading across the compound. We later found out the spillage is as a result of a broken pipe from the Legon Hospital, which has eight pipes passing through the school. This classroom has been abandoned by students due to the stench. This classroom has been deserted by students because the stench that emanates from the liquid waste that come from the Legon Hospital is too much for them to bear. So they have to go and join the other colleagues in the other classroom to study. A situation teachers are saying is very bad and it's affecting teaching here. Both GHS 2A and B are combined. A situation the student says is affecting their studies. For how long have you been experiencing this bad stench? For about one month now. For about a month now? Yeah. Okay, so how is this affecting your learning here? We can't learn because we are combined here. The weather too is hot, so we are suffering. The scent is so bad to the student, it affects our, our learning. Even they crowded us in one class, and this class is very hot. We cannot stay. As you can see, we are hot here. None of the teachers would speak on camera. 
not even the circuit supervisor whom we met on the campus. Later, we saw a team of workers from the Legon Hospital assessing the situation, but would also not comment. Joseph Armstrong, go with Alibi. T3 News, Legon. So let's go to the Legon Hospital where my colleague Martin Esiedu Data is joining us to update us on the current situation. So we are reaching you live. We are reaching you live from the University Staff Village Basic School. You're also watching Midday Live on TV3, also live, live on DSTV University. Channel 2, 7 now. We're working the lines to get back to Martin Yesirudate at the Legon Hospital. Tell us a lot more about this liquid waste and how it is posing threat to pupils and students of the Legon Staff School. That is from on my far right, that is a university hospital. And the problem is that for the last month and a bit over that, there seemed to be a problem water seeps out of the sewage onto the uh, school compound and this is water that smells so if you enter the premises all the teachers and the students have these face masks on and when we got there we could also attest to that fact that the stench emanating from the sewer is deadly we have some of the teachers here they'll be talking to us briefly but i'm sure you saw in the story that was played a while ago where the water that was spilled on the floor was shown and just after yesterday's report if you see right here in front of me they have come to show some level of work and if you look down within it is a concrete a mixture of cement to try and cover the sewer which probably has burst so what they are trying to do is give a temporary solution to a problem that has persisted for well over a month. Let's talk to some of the teachers briefly and find out what the problem has been for them. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. What is your name? Thank you. My name is Kabuna Opoku Asemsro. What subject do you teach and how, what kind of problem have you been facing and how long have you had this problem? I teach mathematics. Mm. Um, this problem has been occurring for the past years. It has been a perennial problem. But then any time we inform the university authorities to come see to it, they come here and do something shoddy and go back. But then the past two weeks, this has been very serious, mm. as you can see. And that these are our classrooms where this whole issue actually halted academic work. Mm. And then we just took the initiative yesterday to let them know and of course, you people also heard of the issue. So you came here, just as the head, you guys were here, they also ran here to fix this thing. And this is a temporal thing. And as you can see, the stench is still yeah. all over the place. We can still not concentrate. We are uncomfortable. Mm. You come here as a teacher or a worker, a student, you can't eat under this condition. Mm. Teachers can come to school the whole day they've not eaten anything because of the stench and even for the pupils how are yes. they taking this the people they don't concentrate because of the strength they are unable to concentrate mm. whenever you are teaching mm. they are covering their noses they're uncomfortable fanning their 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 mm. noses with 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 uh, with books, for and, books stuff. and stuff so academic have, work have you raised this let, let me find out from um, your other colleagues here thank you for joining us just yeah, briefly yeah. your name I'm Mr. Lee. I teach English here. Okay. Yes, uh, it has been a problem with the entire student population here. Mm. We've tried severally getting a permanent solution to this problem, but uh, it's not working. Have you, have you, in the course of all this, spoken to the parents of the wards when they bring them in? And what kind of contribution do you think the parents have given? Or have they said anything about it at all? Yes, at a point in time, the PTA chairman took it over, visited the estate department, they always bring their men to fix it, but it's, it recurs. It so just yesterday, after your reporters came in, they came in quickly to actually do what we are all seeing now. Mm. The director in charge of uh, PDMSD, one Mr. Kofi Inti, visited the school this morning and assured the staff that by close of day, the whole place will be fumigated and then the problem will be fixed once and for all. Okay. What we have also seen is that, okay, madam, uh, as teachers, how concerned are you looking at the fact that day in, day out, you come here to fa face a problem that there seems not to be any solution to? It is a big worry to us. Mm. Uh, that is why yesterday we reported to them that it's our wish that they even direct 
the whole thing mm. from here. Since it's uh, worrying us, we can't eat. Mm. The children, one serious thing is that you see the KG people putting their hands in the water. They don't know what mm. it, it, will, it, will, it will be done to them. You see, so it's a big problem. And we wish it's fixed once and for all. Fortunately, as they say, TV or radio for that matter does get results and it is the lives of Ghanaians, teachers who have put their lives on the line and worst of all, children as young as those that are in primary or basic schools that attend KG, kindergarten it, it is, who come here to learn. Well over 900 pupils attend this school and their lives are at risk. The city authorities must do something about this because even when the report came out, some of them thought that it was a threat to their jobs and wanted to gag the media or stop the teachers from letting the, the, the lights be shown on such a problem which is of risk and concern to all. We hope that a permanent solution is found to this problem. From the premises of the university teachers, uh, um, staff village, uh, basic school that is, my name is Martin Isidudat. We will keep an eye on this development and make sure that whatever updates we get, we bring it to you. Back to you in the studio. Thank you very, very much, Martin. And sure, we'll keep an eye on this because Media General is starting a campaign to check in sanitary environmental conditions in the country. So you'll be seeing a lot more of these stories going forward. You can also be a part of the campaign by following us with the hashtag MD Clean Ghana or hashtag Act Now. Let us find a way to solve the insanitary conditions in the country. On our MTN video report today, our citizen journalist Joseph Amo reports on abandoned ICT lab at Kwadaso NA School in the Ashanti region. This building is the computer lab built for Kwadaso Estate MA Schools in 2014 under the UNDP Government of Ghana program. This computer lab is yet to be handed over to the school since its completion in 2014. Although people do not have a place to learn computing, investigations conducted shows that there is financial litigation between the contractor and KMA. The building, which has not been used, is quickly depleting. It leaks, and the computers which are supposed to stock it never arrive. We implore the KME to speed up in settling any misunderstanding with the contractor. Hand over to the school for the people to get access to computers and a better place to learn ICT. This is coming from citizen journalist Joseph Amo, Kwadasu Estate, Kumase. You can also send your video report via WhatsApp on 055 1433 Media Live returns after this break. Don't go away. Welcome back. This is Media Live on TV3. The Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, PURC, has approved an 11.17% tariff increase for recovery of total electricity revenue management for the regulated electricity market effective July 1, 2019. A statement issued by the PURC on Friday, June 21, 2019, signed by the Executive Secretary, Mrs. Mami Dufio Fori, said in taking the above decision, the Commission has received and considered tariff proposals from stakeholders, including the Volta River Authority, VRA, Ghana Grid Company Limited, Electricity Company of Ghana, Power Distribution Service Ghana Limited, Northing Electricity Distribution Company, Netco, and Enclave Power Company Limited. So that is the updates there when it comes to electricity tariffs. But Megdad Mohammed is with the IES and he's joining me. So we talk a lot more on this. Thank you for joining us, Megdad. Sure, so course. most of us were looking forward to an announcement by the PURC, but is this what we're looking out for when it comes to how much has been increased, 11.17 percent? Well, um, thank you very much for having me. I, I believe what we've seen is something that could have been worse. 
uh, because so far the you could have gone higher, than, have this. Gone higher than this because as a think tank uh, we've read we've read con concerns previously that the amount we are paying for power is not realistic it is one of the reasons why we are in a sector which is bleeding and eventually managers of the sector will have to do makeshift efforts to try and contain things. When Ghanaians are in doing so and they are suffering and they are complaining about the inefficiency in the system and even sometimes the, uh, the seeming incompetence of the handlers of the system is because uh, the money for them to run the system is not there. For example, for the 2018 power year loan, I believe I was here about some weeks ago to talk about that uh, uh, problem that you can't have a, an, an ECG, for example, that uh, within just one year is accumulating a debt beyond two billion Ghana cities mm. simply because uh, Ghanaians are not paying realistic tariffs. And Ghanaians were not paying realistic tariffs because of the politicians at the helm of affairs. When they make a political promise, for example, that when you elect me, I'll reduce tariff. When they are reducing, they're not doing it because they want the system to run effectively. They are doing it because they want the public to love them. And when the public loves you at the expense of debts, it will not be something that uh, should be sustainable. Mm. And as a result of that uh, reduction, the 25% band reduction for in industrial uses, and I think 20% for residential uses, yeah. and, and so on and so forth, you had the ECG, as at the time, before PDS came in, ECG was buying the power 59 cents, selling at 42 cents per kilowatt per hour. So for every single transaction, the state was losing 17 cents per kilowatt per hour simply because the politician said he was reducing uh, uh, tariffs. Sorry. And even before then, the PLL levy in the price builder for electricity was slashed from 5% to 2%. The uh, public, uh, there's another national electricity service uh, levy, which was also reduced from 5% to 3%. All of this served to make people happy, but at what cost? We're bleeding inside. We're bleeding inside. So when uh, uh, the PURC, in conjunction with other stakeholders there uh, in the sector, decided to come to an agreement on tariff adjustment, we did not, as a think tank, based on the figures we have seen, expect to see a figure of a reduction. Mm. So the justification by the PURC, mm. is it something we should go by? Well, the most important justification that I would say the figure is realistic, but the most important justification must be that when Ghanaians are paying more for power, they must begin to see changes mm. in the quality of power distribution and delivery they are getting. Yeah. Where, yes, we agree that there's been a bleed, uh, a bleed in the system that must be uh, uh, stopped. If it must be stopped, it must be linked with uh, improvement in the quality of the service people are, and the are, are receiving. And the supply yeah. people are receiving. But where, yes, uh, we give you the backing to increase tariff only to uh, make the books of a, a multinational good when the quality of the service has not improved. It will be something that maybe our counterparts in consumer agency will come after them. All right, so let's just stay in the energy mm. sector because we also know fuel prices are expected to go up at the pumps after the National Petroleum Authority released a new price build up. The reduction margin is between three and five percent and this is as a result of the activation of the price stabilization and recovery levy as well as the falling petroleum prices on the international markets. The reduction the was also share. predicted by your institution, the IES. So let's talk about Some what it means when we say the price stabilization prices. levy has been activated. Well, the price stabilization, uh, the, the, the price stabilization and recovery levy was mm. introduced into the price build-up uh, in 2015 by the ESLA Act. Uh, they introduced two levies, actually, the energy uh, uh, service levy and then, then the uh, petroleum uh, levy. Uh, it was meant to the first for the to dwell on the price stabilization and recovery levy it was meant to do uh, three things basically okay. cushion consumers in terms of high prices mm. uh, still in the price build up we have uh, regulated products like premix yeah. it's still regulated it will mean that you'll have to pay some subsidies to the suppliers it was meant to do that and the other one is just for forex uh, uh, issues in the sector over the period what we have seen uh, is that the mpa has used that to cushion prices. Mm. For example, for this uh, 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 window, the MPA could have uh, simply uh, left it as it is for prices to go further down for consumers. But when I look at, uh, fairly, when I look at the energy, the ESLA report for 2018, I see that uh, government lost about 270 million Ghana cities because of uh, the deactivation of the levy at intervals okay. within the year where fuel prices were high. So what the MPA does within such periods is that they want to take advantage of the uh, fall, fall in prices. For example, on the international markets, uh, PMS, uh, petrol, has fallen by about 14% since 
gas oil or diesel has fallen by about 10%. Mm. Crude oil itself has been down by about 9.5%. So you could have the, had the natural trickle the down natural here. natural trickle down, yeah. which will have meant that today we, we have been buying a liter of fuel at about 499 or at most 5 cities, 0, 05 pesos. But the MPA, uh, believing that they have already sacrificed the price stabilization and recovery levy over the period, want to cash in. Which we are already we have a problem, a whole gamut of issues mm. with the yes. way and manner. If we want to bring out the issues, MPA has been we can't finish. The, so let, let me find mm -hmm. out how this translates into prices at the pumps. Have we seen the reduction take effect already? Yes, uh, so far I have seen about uh, 17 uh, four filling station OMCs reduce their prices. Only that because of the activation again of the price stabilization recovery level, we made a projection of about 35% reduction. But the reduction we are seeing at the pump is about 1.5 to 1.7%, depending on the OMC mm -hmm. you are dealing with, All which right. we think that uh, the, it shouldn't have been done. Okay. It will have been a direct way of government or MP putting money back into the pocket of Ghanaians after enduring periods of high fuel prices. All right, thank you very much. Megdad Mohammed is a research analyst with the IES. And that's it for the bulletin. Many thanks for your company over the last 16 minutes. My name is Grace Hamwa. Sorry, enjoy the rest of your afternoon.